So next up, we have a new Sherman Fairchild Fellow here at Caltech. Her name is Lena Nasib, and she will be talking about empirical determination of dark matter velocity distributions. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you for having me today. Uh, this is literally my second week in California. Uh, so I'm very excited to actually get to talk to you all about what I'm thinking about and in particular about the, how we've empirically determined the velocity distribution of dark matter. <coughs> so this uh, work has been done in collaboration with Jonah Herzoger Brightman and Mary Angela Nassanti from Princeton. Uh, so basically I'm going to start with a punchline and then walk my way backwards. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions. So the bottom line here is that there is a new velocity distribution of dark matter that I would rather you use <laughs> when you estimate direct detection limits. Um, and today I'm going to tell you exactly how we get there, and especially how we've empirically found the, uh, this new velocity distribution. So, but before then, before I tell you how we get there, uh, I need to tell you why you should care at all. Um, and the reason for that is that this new velocity distribution makes the bounds on dark matter in direct detection experiments weaker uh, for low mass dark matter, so for masses 10 GeV and lower. And weaker by almost a factor of two. So it is really actually quite a bit of a change. <coughs> All right, so let's rewind. What's direct detection? Uh, well, direct detection is basically when dark matter scatters off the center model. And generally, this happens in big tanks of xenon, for example. And w the most important thing that you need to remember from here is that this, uh, r this, this detection rate depends on uh, the velocity distribution of dark matter. The way we use this velocity distribution actually helps us to make these plots that you've seen quite a bit. So on the x-axis, we have the mass of the dark matter. On the y-axis, we have the um, dark matter standard model cross-section. <coughs> and you've always seen limits like this. This is, for example, from xenon one ton. And having this velocity distribution actually might, uh, might change the way we see these bounds. And in particular, here in this case, for uh, low mass, uh, this kind of sharp edge here might actually change by a factor of two, which is very important. All right, so let's first of all talk strategy. How do we empirically measure velocity distribution of dark matter if we cannot see dark matter altogether? Well, <coughs> this, uh, the, basically the bottom line here is actually try to find dark matter tracers, something that behaves like dark matter and you can see it. Going through, so um, this is basically the three-step process that we have. Uh, from simulations, we found that metal core stars, and I'll tell you a little more about these later, um, trace the velocity distribution of dark matter, which means that they have similar kinematics. So we have a set, a population of stars that have similar kinematics as dark matter, and we've seen that in simulation. So knowing this, or assuming this, uh, we went to the first data release of Gaia, and actually made like a distribution of the uh, velocity distribution of these metal poor stars. Putting one and two together, we have the velocity distribution of dark matter. And of course, there are a lot of caveats here, but let's, this is what, basically what the storyline is. All right, so let's try to think more about what are these metal four stars. Well, the universe started with very few things. Um, and the way I think about it is just that we started with quarks and electrons, and then as the temperature of the universe kind of cooled down, everything kind of started bounding together, and we started having, for example, hydrogen and helium and uh, heavier elements. But before we get to m many of these heavier elements, we started having the first stars. So these first stars didn't have really much going on, so not much beyond these hydrogen and helium. <coughs> So just so you know that uh, I've discovered recently uh, that in astro, everything beyond helium is a metal, which is kind of goes against everything they teach you in chemistry, but that's okay. Um, so when we say metal poor, it's just that we want these stars to, uh, we're talking about very, very old stars that generally have hydrogen and helium. So to explain some kind of notation that I'll be using a little later, so we have the way we talk about this metallicity is with Fe over H. And this is uh, basically the relative abundance of iron relative to hydrogen compared to the sun. So if I say, for example, Fe over H is minus 1, this is logarithmic scale, this means that the star has a tenth of the iron fraction of the sun. Minus 2 is a hundredth, and, so, uh, and it goes like that. <coughs> all right. So why would these stars behave like dark matter at all? So 
if this is your Milky Way, these days we actually have, uh, we've seen quite a few what we call streams, which are these, uh, well, groups of stars or, that, or, for example, dwarves that are just getting, uh, yeah, there's, <coughs> uh, they're just getting tidally stripped as they merge into a Milky Way. Well, the older stars, as well as, the, uh, as, well as dark matter, actually, formed through accretion. So a lot, of it can, uh, a lot of the dark matter and these old stars kind of formed what we call the stellar halo and the dark matter halo through uh, these accretion events. Basically, these older stars will have, therefore, kind of the same formation history. And that's why you kind of have the kinematic imprinting um, of... Um, of uh, this early on, uh, so basically of these older stars and dark matter to be the same. <coughs> All right, so, yeah, this is weird. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so um, we, use the, uh, we use the error simulation to actually verify this. And uh, here we have a histogram of the radial velocity. And, what you, and there, are, there are a lot of labels here, but you just... All you should think about is this Fe over H, what we talked about earlier. And the bottom line is that the more, the stronger you cut a metallicity, the closer these histograms get to the dark matter one, which is the black one. Of course, we've seen this in only one simulation, and you need to see it in multiple simulations to try to kind of make sure that this is actually accurate. <coughs> Where can we find these metal floor stars? So we, this is our Milky Way. We live here. And there are different com stellar components to our Milky Way. But what you want is the oldest stars that actually formed the stellar halo. So these guys. <coughs> and the way we look at that is we use the Gaia uh, first data release. All right, so there might be a, quite a few things in this plot. Um, these are all the stars that pass some quality cuts, uh, but the most important thing is that on the x-axis here we have the radial distance from the, from the center of the galaxy. So at 8 kiloparsecs we actually live here. Uh, this is the vertical distance. And the colors here is the, is the uh, iron fraction of the metallicity. Okay? So basically when Fe over H is zero, this is very similar to the sun. And you can see here that these are basically the disk stars. And as you go lower, as you go further and further from the disk plane, you're getting to lower and lower metallicities. Here there are five stars that, that uh, are kind of special to us, and I'll tell you more about them later. So in order to actually get this plot, we had to kind of collect quite a few things. Um, so we use the heliocentric velocities from the RAVE catalog, uh, the promotions from T-gas, the chemical properties, and in this case, the metallicities from Ray Vaughan, and distances from the Macmillan et al., which actually was published a month ago, I think. So we said that we wanted these halo stars, and in order to do so, we want, we, uh, want the metal poor stars. Basically, we want to mask the disk, and we want, to mask, uh, and we want the most metal poor. So you make these two cuts, and pretty much you're left with these far away stars, which are metal poor. Okay, so that gives us uh, a sample of, uh, with a cut of minus 1.5 uh, for F over H and 1.5 of Z, we are left with only 141 stars, so it's a very limited sample actually. In order to analyze it, we have, basically we're trying to break it up into two components and try to find the best fit parameters. We want the parameters for the stellar halo, which is actually what we care about here, but we're also going to give parameters of what we call the kinematic outliers, just in, just in order not to bias our sample in case there are some stars that actually really don't belong. To do so, we use a markup chain Monte Carlo and find the best parameters for these stellar halos and any kinematic outliers. Um, so this is, we use what we call the uh, Gaussian mixture model. So we have two, two three-dimensional Gaussians here. So for this, and this is done in, um, in velo spatial velocity in spherical coordinates. So we have, uh, for each one of them, I have nine parameters. So three means, three correlations, and three dispersions. So I have nine parameters here, nine parameters here. And I have a 19th parameter that kind of gives me basically the fraction uh, or the relative fraction between these two components. So 32 cores of computing time later, you end up with this. Um, which is Q 
here on the x-axis we have vr and v theta, vr, v phi, and v theta, v phi. And we have these contours for basically what, um, what the, uh, uh, the stellar halo or the best fit parameters for the stellar halo are. So the interesting thing is that um, here, or the, color, the colors here, is actually the probability of a star belonging to the halo. And we have these quite a few, th these quite a few stars, and in this case like five stars, which are colored a little differently, that don't quite fit. And these are actually very interesting for us because we, we need to actually further study the origin of these stars, and because they might be just outer halo stars, but the interesting part is that if these stars are actually coming from dwarves, um, it mi they might be associated with some dark matter substructure, which would be very interesting for us to actually learn about. So, this is basically what we're thinking about next, is trying to understand the origin of these five stars. All right, so without any uh, longer ado, we have the local velocity distribution, which is all what we wanted, and it's this. So, here we actually have uh, two different analyses, one with FE over H of minus 1.5 and one with minus 1.8. Uh, of course, what we want is to actually get lower and lower metallicity, but of course, at some point, you run out of statistics. Uh, so hopefully, with future data, we're going to be able to push it even lower. But the thing that we have here is what I call a uh, standard halo model. This is actually the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that we're taught at school, and it's the one that we actually use for all the other plots. <coughs> so. Uh, this is very hard to kind of judge by eye, but we can tell you that these two uh, distributions actually, actually have a six sigma discrepancy, so they have nothing to do with each other pretty much. We want to apply this to direct detection, uh, which is the most important here. Uh, so the direct detection rate actually depends on three different things. So it depends on astrophysics, and this is by the dark matter density and the velocity distribution, which is what I'm talking to you today about on the particle physics, for example, the cross scattering cross-section, the methods of dark matter, and of course on experimental physics, when you have like the form factor or, and basically the mass of the nucleus or the target nucleus that you're using. So today we've been focusing on this function, which is actually the integral of f of v that I showed you earlier, um, uh, from, what we, from v min to infinity. And v min here is just set by the, uh, the experiment and the dark matter mass. So if I plot a GV min here, uh, I find that, so here on the x-axis we have V min, and this is GV min, um, and blue and red are the two, two different analyses that we have, uh, and the dashed gray here is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, and you can see that they're actually pretty different here. So for uh, dark matter mass of 10 GeV, we actually put the points here of uh, where, where each, um, where each uh, experiment is actually sensitive. And you see that for the experiments that we're actually thinking about these days, especially in Xenon and CDMS, we're actually off by almost a factor of two. So understanding this is actually very important. And, um, and to make sure that we get proper limits, uh, we actually have the uh, numerical extrapolation for these distributions available in the paper. So to summarize, we have a new distribution uh, that we've empirically found uh, for, uh, for dark matter, and this is really exciting and new. Of course, there are more, uh, there's more research that we need to do in order to establish that. Um, so with future, data, with future data releases or guy releases, we're going to have smaller error bars, which will be very helpful. But also, it's very important for us to actually understand uh, if these kinematic outliers are any sign of dark matter substructure. Thank you.